All right, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Welcome again to everyone who's joining us. We're really excited. I'm very excited to be here. My name is Logan Rockefeller Harris. I'm a research manager with the North Carolina Budget and Tax Center. And um, I am joined by Amelia Vaughn, who's the co-director of research capacity at the Children's Funding Project, and Nat Mudd, who's a data analyst with the Community Innovation and Action Center, the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Did I get, yes, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, we're gonna be, today we're gonna be sharing a new tool that we're really excited about uh, that we uh, collaborated with Children's Funding Project on, which is a, a fiscal map for state and federal funding for children and youth in our state. And uh, are gonna be both, uh, uh, Nat is gonna kind of walk us through the map and how to use it. Uh, and then are gonna discuss some advocacy priorities in the state connected particularly to funding for children and youth and also to ensuring that we have the revenue we need to make those key investments. Um, I'm going to start off by saying a little bit more about the North Carolina Budget and Tax Center for folks that aren't familiar with our organization. Uh, so we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. We work statewide in North Carolina. And our vision is a state where every person can reach their full potential and achieve well being through the support of trustworthy anti racist institutions and systems that we all participate in building. Um, and so we do that work both through research and analysis of fiscal and economic conditions kind of across the state and also with collaboration um, with community-based organizations, uh, government agencies, uh, statewide advocates, um, and just local advocates in their communities that are working to create you know, economic conditions that support everybody and to build racial equity. So we have some, our kind of major priorities are budgets that meet everybody in the state's needs, tax policy that asks uh, very rich people and corporations to pay what they owe so that we have the funding that we need to meet those needs, um, and you know, economic policy that really supports uh, um, opportunity for everyone. And we have also had uh, a kind of issue area focus on early childhood education and adequate funding and sort of financing for the early childhood education system, uh, which is what brought us into this partnership with the Children's Funding Project. Um, and I'm actually gonna turn it over to Amelia to talk a little bit more about kind of what a fiscal map is and why it's important for advocates like us. Sure, hi everyone, Amelia Vaughn. Um, and and I'm, my title has now changed. I'm the Director of um, Fiscal Data Infrastructure at Children's Funding Project. And we see a fiscal map really as a piece, being a core piece of a fiscal data infrastructure that a um, state or locality can have to help them learn more about how public and sometimes private funds um, are being uh, invested in children and youth. And uh, we were very excited to work with Logan um, and her team on creating this North Carolina state fiscal map, looking at investments um, ages zero to 24 in the state. And North Carolina was actually one of 14 states that participated in a cohort that we uh, started in 2022. Um, to to increase this fiscal data infrastructure across the country. Um, and it was a pleasure working with Logan and her team because they were really invested in making sure that the data was very accurate and very representative um, of, um, of the funding landscape for children and youth in the state. Um, and I'm really excited to continue partnership with her and with you all here to, to think about how we can now use this, this fiscal map as a tool for enhanced decision-making for children and youth and, and funding for children and youth. And so I'm actually gonna pass it over to my colleague, Nat Mud Brooks, um, who was the, the lead hand in, in creating this fiscal map report. And she's gonna walk us through um, some of the key highlights and how to utilize the, the different interactions of the report. Thanks, Amelia. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and pull up that fiscal map now. Great, and can I just get a quick thumbs up, Logan, that you can see this, okay? 
Thank you. Okay, great. Well, as Amelia said, she did a great job kind of summarizing what is a fiscal map. And so I've been working with Logan and several other state budget holders to collect this data. And so I'm really excited to share it because it has just been a labor of love. And um, it's really, I think, a unique tool to be used by both advocates and North Carolina residents. And so this is just our introduction page, and you can see there's a bit of a table of contents over to the right. Um, what you can do um, with Power BI is click on any of those. It'll take you to its respective page. And so I'll just dive into uh, the fiscal map itself and highlight some examples of how you can use this like as, as different types of advocates um, and start to understand what the funding landscape looks like for our children and youth in North Carolina. Um, but to start off with some logistics, there is a navigating the map page, which kind of walks you through how to use the fiscal map itself. And then also our final page is our methodology page. And so if you're curious about any of our parameters, tax, um, taxonomy, that sort of thing, um, please refer back to this final page where it talks about what's included, what's excluded, and then some of our methodology of how we've coded things and how it's reflected in the map. Um, so this was the page that we were just looking at as Amelia was describing what is a fiscal map. And so this just serves as our summary page. These amounts up here at the top are cumulative of three different funding levels. So we're looking at COVID relief as well as state and federal. And that's reflected down here in this bar chart of funding level. Um, and you can see that we're looking at fiscal years 2019, 2020, and 2021. So that kind of puts us at this unique disposition of analyzing COVID relief funding. And so I'll get into that in just a little bit uh, later into the report. Um, but I do also want to bring attention to the outcome categories. And uh, so those five categories are safe, employed, connected, and supported healthy and educated. So if you're interested in any of those specific outcome categories, what you could do on this page is click on that. Um, say you're interested in that healthy outcome category. It changes our visuals down here on the funding level, as well as those cumulative amounts up there, as well as this uh, inventory, this list of funding streams that we've collected on those three different funding levels. Um, and you can scroll through there, or if you wanna make it larger, there's also a focus mode that pulls up that whole list. I did also wanna note education real quick because we do see that it does heavily outweigh all of these other outcome categories, which is gonna be a common theme that we see in a lot of these pages as well. And this is because if this includes K-12 education, as well as higher education and early childhood education. And then with higher education as well, I do want to note that we know that not everyone in college is that 18 to 24 age range. So proxies are applied there. So we're not using that full amount. And so um, with that methodology applied, you can kind of get a better idea of what funding looks like for education specifically. So moving forward to our services page, a little bit overwhelming when you're looking at it like this. Um, so I want to kind of talk through how you could uh, use this page practically and get the most out of it. So let's say you're an early childhood advocate. What I'd recommend doing is going through this list and selecting those different early childhood education pieces. Um, and you're feel free to look through this list. There's a lot of different services that we've tagged anything from out of school time to juvenile justice programs, um, higher education, and anything that's uh, social programs, like such as like welfare programs like SNAP and TANF are also included um, in some capacity as well. Um, but again, to get the most out of it, I just recommend going through the eligible services, selecting what you want to compare and get eyes on, and looking at the data that way. Um, we've also included a little funding level chart here. So if you're interested in looking at what that state level funding is looking like for early childhood, you could click on state. And again, you see our visuals change ever so slightly, and it changes our list of funding streams as well. And moving along to our next page, this is how another way that we've kind of conceptualized visualizing the data. 
um, looking at eligibility criteria as well as level of intervention. So these are all the same funding streams that are included on the previous pages, but let's say that uh, you work with unhoused populations. One way that you could start understanding what the funding landscape looks like for this population is clicking on these different eligibility criteria over here. Um, and so anywhere you see unhoused, you can select and it'll populate that list once again. Um, and so that's how you would use this eligibility criteria uh, tree map uh, visual. Um, but again, you see on the level of intervention, it highlights the, the overlap uh, from what I selected on this visual. And so the four different levels of intervention that we're looking at here is positive youth development. And that includes things such as education, out of school time, as well as youth workforce development. Basic services is also included. And that's gonna be things such as nutrition support and healthcare. And then intervention and prevention, those are pretty self-explanatory. So what programs are um, intervening versus preventing. Um, and then you could get a more granular look if you were interested in positive youth development by just clicking on that and looking through that list there. Now, moving forward to our ages, this is just another way that we've categorized our data. Um, we've, we're looking at a few different age ranges here and we've kind of divided it up by early childhood, pre-K, elementary and middle school, high school, and then uh, beyond high school um, into college, workforce, development, that sort of thing. And so that was the rationale behind these different age ranges. But with this uh, data visual, we decided to look at the estimated count of funding sources versus an exact dollar amount just with uh, the overlap in a lot of those funding streams. They support a lot of different age ranges, that sort of thing. So um, let's say you're, again, you're an early childhood advocate. If you wanted to start to understand what that funding landscape looked like for that group, oops, you could go through, click on those ages and kind of get a comparison of those, those uh, age ranges and the funding streams that support them. And now the next few pages, I'll just highlight briefly, they are fiscal year, individual fiscal year analysis. And so for fiscal year 2019, 2020, and 21, these next three pages all look pretty similar um, and just highlights what, what was going on in that uh, exact fiscal year. So we have some population data and demographics to start to tie together some of the current outcomes of of children and youth in North Carolina versus what was happening at that point in time with our investments. And so you can look through some of those uh, population and data demographics and start to tell a story of what was happening at that point in time. Um, and again, all of these data visuals interact with one another. So if you wanted to look at uh, those prevention services, you could click on that little pie slice and it'll change our visuals just like on all the other pages. Now I wanna highlight the COVID relief funding page. This looks identical to the services page that we looked at a few pages back, um, but this time it looks at just specifically COVID relief funding. And now we're only looking at 2020 and 2021. Um, again, K-12 education always outweighs a lot of our other things. So one way you could, uh, get a better look at this is by deselecting K-12, and it kind of gives you a more granular look at what the funding landscape was at that point in time. Um, but again, uh, if you are an early childhood advocate, you could use this um, by going through that services, selecting those different ones and comparing side by side. Um, and I will say this includes different funding relief packages such as uh, ARPA, CARES, SIRSA, as well as SLRF dollars. Um, and so we've done a, a pretty thorough analysis on trying to capture all those different funding streams. And then coming up on our final page, 
um, is a state budget comparison page. And this starts to look at what percentage of the budget is supporting children and youth versus supporting uh, just other state spending. And so we've included an age demographic uh, pie chart to understand what percentage of the population in North Carolina is zero to 24 versus 25 plus. And then there is the year by year state revenue spending um, just as I mentioned, this just highlights what's going towards children and youth versus other state spending. And we've also opted to include this without K-12 public education spending, because I, as I had mentioned, in some of those other visuals, we saw that education uh, frequently outweighs a lot of these other, other pieces of data. And so we wanted to highlight what percentage of the budget is still supporting children and youth without that K-12 piece included. The last thing I want to highlight on this page is our per capita children and youth spending. And so this dollar amount is derived based on population as well as percentage of the budget going towards children and youth. And this is just to start to understand how much money is going towards children and youth. Um, and then once again, we've opted to include this without that K-12 education and spending piece. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you so much, Nat. I, Nat did a really an enormous amount of work combing through our various um, budget documents to pull this data out. And I will also just, you know, acknowledge there's a lot of information in this fiscal map. Um, Katerina Marakin, who I realized I didn't introduce at the beginning, is a communications associate with BTC, and she dropped a link in the chat to where folks can access the fiscal map kind of for them, you know, for yourself and, and walk through it. And we're definitely open to you know, additional questions, um, thoughts that you have about, you know, data accessibility, et cetera, kind of as you get a chance to go through it on your own. Um, I'm going to switch back to my presentation and then pass it to Amelia to talk a little bit more about the national analysis. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Nat. You did a great job. Um, you And uh, I think most of you all in North Carolina know this, but at least during one of these fiscal years, there wasn't a budget um, uh, passed. So there was um, a lot of different decision making and decision points that um, Logan and Nat had to make to determine the best uh, dollar amount or number uh, to include for specific line items. So I think we did a really good job um, with some, some tricky fiscal years. Um, but so what I'm gonna do now is um, I'm gonna now share my screen and show you how North Carolina's fiscal map fits into this larger national landscape and national trends that we at Children's Funding Project are um, trying to see. Um, so maybe if I could get a thumbs up, on, if you can see my screen. Okay, awesome. Um, so I mentioned earlier that um, in this first year of this state um, child and youth fiscal map cohort, it was a cohort when um, during the time that Logan participated, uh, we were working with 14 other states and those states are listed um, here. Um, also just to note that this is our landing page for um, where this data lives for now, but um, we're undergoing a website redesign. So in a month or so, this this page may look a little bit different, but I welcome you to, to explore it on your own and also look um, a little bit more about what we do at Children's Funding Project. Um, but this landing page uh, describes, if you read through the text, describes what we were trying to accomplish um, with this cohort. And it also answers a few more questions specifically about what is a fiscal map um, what does this information contain, um, why we did this analysis, et cetera. Um, so please, please, please um, read this through if you have more questions about our methodology and also our reasoning. Um, but but truly, we just, we, we get a lot of um, interest in creating these fiscal maps for states and localities. And we decided that it was finally time to make them all utilize the same language and talk the same talk um, so that we can create a national movement of how funding for children and youth is discussed across the country. Um, and so this was our first take at trying to do um, a fiscal map using the same methodology 
um, for multiple places, which which was great and we we were successful. But of course, each state has its own context, so there are a lot of differences and nuances state to state. Um, uh, and so each state has its own fiscal map tool, like the one that showed you for North Carolina, and those can be accessed either here via these hyperlinks or um, up top in this text. But what we also tried to do, um, and this was our first take at this, was um, start to look at some sort of resemblance of national trends um, in how states fund um, cradle to career uh, services. Um, and so we, we still have a lot to learn about um, what these trends mean. Um, and as we accumulate more fiscal map data, so as we add more states to uh, this partnership, I think that these trends will become more robust and I, we'll, we'll be able to, to discover even more tangibles about place-to-place um, -place how states invest in children and youth um, and what other trends emerge. But um, first of all, we have um, just a, a table that contextualizes the size of each state and also how children and youth are, are doing based on these various met metrics in each state. And then we do show um, the breakdown of what is the share state to state of state funding, federal relief funding, and federal funding. And even with this visual, there's a lot um, to discuss because states differ um, by how much uh, state funding versus local funding supports some of their child and youth systems like K-12 education um, or child welfare. And that local piece is not um, captured here, but so you, some it, it is helpful to, to learn a little bit more about each of these states' contexts before drawing any hard conclusions. But overall, you can um, start to see kind of how states compare in size of budget and then also um, the reliance of federal and federally funds as well as pure state investment. And then if I can find my mouse. Um, it, this is a, also made in Power BI, like the, the fiscal map that uh, Nat showed you. Uh, and we we did try to do a few more analyses that, that um, again, look at trends state by state um, to not do comparisons of pointing fingers, but just to see what the differences are. And hopefully that will then unlock some future research around why are these differences here and help us just learn more about um, state context. But um, this, uh, this visual here plays off of the uh, last page of the fiscal map report that Nat showed you. So the percent of state budget invested in children and youth apart from school and that per capita investment in ages zero to 24 apart from school. And again, the reason why we just pulled out that K-12 like big line item is because it is a, it's a, a heavy outlier. It's, it's, the, what the majority of all states funding for children and youth go towards is, is funding public education. And um, at Children's Funding Project, of course, we're, we want public education to be fully funded, but we also are really um, try to take care in funding the all of the wraparound supports that are necessary for children, youth, and families to thrive that happen outside of the classroom. Um, so you can just kind of see the spectrum here of, of percent of state budgets that go towards these wraparound services. And what you can do is if you're interested in learning more about North Carolina specifically, you can click on your state uh, in the table. And then these dots um, show that it's so 15% of the state budget um, is invested in children and youth apart from school. And that equates to roughly $1,000 per child. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting over a cold, so <laughs> I'm a little stuffy. <laughs> um, next, again, we just wanted to see that that trend in, in funding. Uh, so this is looking at outcome category. And we, we all want to make sure that our funding is affecting child and youth outcomes. So um, this is just our start to categorize, okay, like what funding is intended to support the various outcomes? And then hopefully over time, 
as we can track the funding, as we can track the outcomes data, we can start to make some correlations be between, okay, if, if we're increasing funding in specific outcomes that need support, is that moving the needle on those specific outcomes? And just to note that this is just the percent of state funds invested in these outcomes. So this does not include a federal or federal relief funding. But if you look at North Carolina again, you see the um, the breakout of, uh, of North Carolina funds. This educated column uh, or um, visual, uh, this does include K-12. So that's why it is such a larger percentage of the state uh, funding compared to healthy, connected and supported. And that means our kids connected and supported to their families and communities, our kids safe and our kids um, employable. Um, one thing to note is we did not include Medicaid funding in, in this fiscal map. So um, that is why this healthy um, outcome has a lower investment uh, figure. If we did include Medicaid funds and we hope to in the future, then that will increase. And then lastly, um, just a very similar look at all of the states, um, state spending, but now in, in those uh, level of intervention categories. And this defines the intended approach that, that a funding stream is, is trying to have. Is it supporting po positive child and youth development and their education from cradle to career? Um, is it providing a basic service um, that meets a basic need? Um, is it specifically intervening um, after uh, an, an event has occurred, or is it trying to prevent a specific outcome? And lastly, again, you can see where North Carolina kind of stacks in that trend line. Um, and similar to the, the state fiscal map, we do have a definitions page that, that um, tries to, uh, in more detail, describe what we mean by outcome category level intervention and give some um, uh, the sources of the data that we used for the demographic data. So I will pass it back to Logan and then I'm going to jump in the chat in the Q&A and hopefully answer everybody's questions. Awesome. Thank you, Amelia. Um, yes. Back here. All right. Get a thumbs up. Do you see a slide? Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about sort of how we are hoping to be using this data and really how it connects to the um, advocacy that's going on in the state right now related to uh, children's and kids that, you know, BTC is involved in with a lot of partners across the state. Uh, and I think that um, one aspect of this uh, map that I'm hoping will be really helpful kind of going forward is being able to tease out federal versus state funding. That's something we get asked a lot from uh, community partners when they're trying to understand kind of how to get investments made in their priorities. Um, and particularly, uh, th this also really shows the huge impact that federal COVID relief funding had. Uh, you know, Nat was talking about the various COVID relief packages that went into uh, supporting uh, children and youth. And most of that money, or a lot of that money is either running out or no longer available. Um, and that certainly connects to some of our advocacy priorities. Um, so, uh, all right, who's deaf? Um, I think uh, there were two that I really wanted to highlight. Um, and I, I also will just acknowledge, you know, the fiscal map is for, it goes through fiscal year 2021. So we know that it's already a couple of years out of date. Um, and I think that for this first round, being able to get that data like in there uh, was a huge lift and we're really excited going forward to be hopefully keeping it kind of more updated to the present so that it is uh, being able to inform like current advocacy uh, priorities. But I did want to shout out um, one priority connected to K through 12 education uh, specifically uh, is full funding for the Leandro plan in North Carolina, um, which for those of you who don't know, um, is a, and Katarina, thank you for dropping kind of chats in the link for folks that want to follow up more about these. Uh, take a look at that. Um, is that uh, the Leandro plan uh, is a plan to address the uh, court finding um, 
over nearly 30 years ago at this point that North Carolina was not providing a sound basic education to every child in the state. And so that plan has been developed to um, to uh, uh, remedy that. There's a really amazing coalition of advocates that we support called Every Child NC that have been uh, doing work around this for uh, you know quite a long time and are continuing to advocate for adequate and equitable funding, uh, particularly for K through 12 education. And then we're also really focused with some of our early childhood partners. And I know I've seen some of those folks are on this call um, or on this webinar uh, to get funding for compensation grants to early childhood educators, which have been uh, supported through some of that federal COVID relief funding that I was mentioning, but it's going to be running out in, uh, it's essentially going to be running out in June. And so it's really crucial kind of in, you know, this year during this legislative session to get state funding to, to make up for that. Hmm. And again, um, there's the, there's this, excuse me, group of early childhood advocates who've kind of come together under this Child Care for NC United for Change umbrella, and they also have an advocacy day uh, planned for May that you can learn about in, in that link. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit more about like revenue overall and uh, current tax policy in uh, North Carolina. You know. We're called the Budget and Tax Center because we care about budgets and we also care about taxes. And I think it's sort of an, like underlying all of this data in the fiscal map is how much revenue the state actually has in order to spend, you know, in order to be able to fund all of the things that our kids need. And so I you know, want to address the current policy context, which is that the General Assembly has actually passed policy that will steadily decrease our tax revenue um, at, you know, for the over the foreseeable future um, by reducing tax rates uh, through 2030. Um, so one aspect of that is that currently on the books uh, is that our corporate income tax will be totally eliminated. So it would be a zero percent uh, rate uh, in 2030. And there are also uh, plans to, or not just plans, there's policy uh, to make deep cuts to our already quite low and flat um, personal income tax rate. And uh, these policies have been passed, but new policies can be passed <laughs> to change this context. Um, and the impact that this will have on our revenue, uh, the revenue available to the state will be really significant. So this chart just shows a um, uh, the estimates from our state's fiscal research division about what the kind of anticipated revenue loss of those changes, both to the corporate income and the personal tax uh, rates are likely to be you know, over the next seven, eight years. Um, and their prediction is that by 2031, when these have been kind of fully put into place, our state will have, you know, a, a revenue loss compared to what, what we could have if we if we kept our current rates of over $13 billion. Um, and if you look at, you know, our, our current budget is around $30 billion total. You can see that information in the fiscal map. Um, it's a really large chunk of revenue. And so we would invite folks that are going to be, you know, that are that care about funding for children and youth to join us, not just in advocating for kind of funding the the things that we need, but also thinking about where where does that money come from and how can we uh, really push for a tax system in which everybody pays what they owe to support, you know, all of our community's ability to thrive. Um, and some just specific opportunities to do that uh, with us. If you are the kind of person who likes to go to multiple webinars a week, I would invite you to attend our uh, quarterly Making Connections webinar tomorrow. It's going to be um, a really good one with both our advocacy manager, Heba Atwa, and then um, a partner uh, with the North Carolina Black Alliance, talking kind of generally about what the... Uh, kind of how the NC uh, General Assembly, our state legislature makes policy, how advocates can try to affect that policy, and thinking, spe you know, talk specifically about some of our advocacy plans connected to trying to keep the corporate income tax so that we can uh, keep, you know, some of that key revenue that we need. 
Um, so Katarina dropped a link to sign up to that in the chat. If you're you're if you have plans for tomorrow, you can sign up and get the recording and the materials, but would love for folks to join us there. Um, and then further down the line, we have an in-person advocacy day coming up on May 22nd. Um, or, sorry, May 2nd. Um, Heba, our advocacy manager, would be so mad at me if she knew that I said that date wrong. <laughs> um, it's going to be on May 2nd. It's called Our Dollars, Our Future. This is the second year that we've held this event. And it's really going to be an opportunity for people to come together from across the state. Um, you know, we're able to provide some support with transportation if folks um, uh, need help getting to Raleigh. This is going to be an advocacy day in Raleigh. Uh, where people are sort of talking about what their vision for a state budget that really supports, you know, their community needs looks like. And certainly we would include uh, really robust funding for children and youth well-being in that. But we really want to hear about um, your priorities. And there's going to be a lot of kind of different opportunities to not only uh, meet with legislators, but also think of kind of creative ways for us to share that message broadly. Mm -hmm. Um. All right, I am gonna pass it back to Amelia to talk a little more about the future of this exciting world if this don't happen. Yes, thank you. Um, and we're getting a lot of great questions in the chat and I'll try to answer those as we go through. Um, but so we, our engagement with Logan and her team is not done. We'd like to continue um, the partnership into and sustaining this fiscal map uh, practice, like I said, as a part of fiscal data infrastructure in the state. And so um, the way that the ways that we would like to um, continue this engagement is to help Logan and her team institutionalize this fiscal mapping process. Um, so that means, uh, you know, really uh, coaching Logan and others about how to update the data over time. Um, hopefully, um, Hopefully that, you know, we've seen in some states uh, that lead to then data sharing agreements or legislation even for um, uh, for sustaining fiscal mapping and codifying it. Um, additionally, uh, so once a state has a fiscal map, we find it's really, really easy then for localities within that state to use the state map as a template for creating their own fiscal maps. <coughs> Excuse me. And then... Uh, again, because they're then speaking the same language and using the same uh, uh, methodology, uh, there can be enhanced state to local alignment about, you know, talking about how funds uh, within the state are then being parsed out to different counties and cities across that state. And so we'd be um, certainly happy to, to support any localities here that um, are interested in the fiscal mapping, talking to you all about how to utilize the state map for your own fiscal mapping efforts. Um, the also the fiscal map is just one piece of what we call um, strategic public financing activities for children and youth. So um, another piece of fiscal data infrastructure is is having a cost model or cost estimation tool for how much um, goals for uh, meeting like meeting goals for a specific service for children and youth actually costs. And then that way, between the fiscal map and the cost model, you can learn, okay, this is how much we're currently investing. And that's what the fiscal map shows us. The cost model tells us um, what is what needs to be spent in order to reach our goals. And then that gap is, is your, your goal dollar amount to have in mind to launch a revenue generation effort. Um, but as Logan just mentioned, the revenue uh, generation may be tough in North Carolina over time. So. Um, you know, I think if if some of that legislation does pass, then to update the the fiscal map data yearly is going to be a really important advocacy tool to show and to make the case for how changes in state revenue um, is affecting how children and youth are supported in the state, uh, and it can um, you know hold accountable or at least show how funds are being or sorry how specific services are being affected by that change in state funding um and i see in the i in the chat um some some questions and and uh ideas for like what are some keywords and phrases or talking points and handouts i we would 
I'll, I would also be very happy to to make some of like a, like a takeaways document with Logan and that um, to to be able to be used with um, their at the advocacy efforts that are happening in the state now and for other local groundwork. Uh, sorry. Uh, grassroots organizations be able to utilize. Um, but I think like for me, one of the biggest conclusions is that the federal relief funding in 2021 was about 10 billion, like it will for 2020 and 2021 was about $10 billion, which was a third of the 2021 budget. When that is no longer available and if state revenue is also changing, then that summary page that Nat showed you in the beginning is is going to look way different and there's going to be a, a much larger reliance on federal funds and then it's you know those services and supports aren't going away for kids or like those they're the need isn't going away so then how are they going to be funded and how are we going to meet those needs of kids um when when the money's not there so I really hope that the fiscal map can be utilized for your own advocacy and and having these difficult conversations and, and making the point that more funding for children and youth um, uh, needs to be uh, to needs to be generated. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, um, please, Logan. So we also had a question about what are the other states that we're including. So Logan um, and team in North Carolina was a part of Wave One which was, has been our largest wave to date. Um, we're currently working on wave two, which includes um, California, Utah, and Kansas. And then just this spring, we're gonna be incorporating five new states into wave three. So that's um, Maryland, Ohio, Arkansas, Wisconsin, and Hawaii. And with, uh, once we have um, all three waves um, uh, mapped, that'll be about half the country, which is really exciting. And our goals are to help all of these states update their data um, potentially next year in 2025 um, with updated methodology that it does include Medicaid because um, we do recognize that that is a big missing piece right now. It was just a, a monster to try to tackle, but we are learning how to do that. And then also some different uh, changes to um, how we code the fiscal data and how we visualize the fiscal data just to make it overall more um, usable to people in each state. Um, so I'm happy to answer some questions live or turn back into the Q&A and answer questions there. Um, yeah, we can. So uh, that is the end of our kind of formal presentation. And we really had the time remaining held to answer questions. And we've got quite a few good ones. So let's we're kind of doing a combination of typing answers um, to respond to the Q&A when that's easy. And I think we can go ahead and answer some live as well. I did want to respond to a, a question specifically about the tax loss chart. Um, so I'm actually just going to go back to that. Um, so this includes, uh, and I can actually make a note of this on the slide before we send the version to you, um, that this includes corporate and um, corporate income and personal income tax changes that are currently in law. So it is not just from um, corporate, uh, it is not just from the corporate uh, income tax elimination. It's both that corporate income tax elimination and reductions in the personal income tax rate that are scheduled, uh, kind of compared to um, the, the 2023 rates. And so thanks again for the clarifying question. And I will um, make a couple changes to the slide just so that uh, you all have a copy of it that makes that really clear. Um, and we don't have, and again, I'm just sort of uh, responding live to some questions that are, are in the Q&A. Um, we don't have a great estimate of the total revenue that the state has lost um, since, since these tax cuts started. Essentially, 2013 is when North Carolina started making significant, um, significant cuts to tax rates that have really been affecting revenue. And so it's... We, all, we try to rely as much as possible on estimates that come directly from the state. And so we don't currently have, have a, an estimate, uh, a really solid estimate from 2013 kind of through now. It's actually some analysis that we're working on at the Budget and Tax Center and are hoping to be able to kind of publish information on that soon. Um, so that's, uh, that's my response to that one. 
I don't know if there are any other, um, let's see. Uh, so there was also a, a question specifically about the, um, here, I'll leave it on this slide about our webinar because I feel most enthusiastic about telling people to go to that webinar <laughs> where we can jump around as needed. Um, there was also a, a question about the that Leandro case that I mentioned. So this is, again, this court case that found that um, North Carolina was not uh, meeting its uh, the constitutional requirement to provide every child with a sound basic education. Um, that case is being re-reviewed sort of in our Supreme Court um, or the, the decision about whether or not the General Assembly is actually required to fund that plan. Um, and I think that there was a, a question about kind of how we would prepare for a negative response from the court. I think we're really working, you know, prioritizing partnering with our public education advocates and re recognizing that in some cases in North Carolina, we're in, you know, a long-term strategy of really building the narrative of why we need these investments and looking towards, a, you know, a, basically in, in a situation in which there is a negative policy result that's really frustrating, but we don't give up and that we continue to work to kind of build the movement of people who are uh, demanding the funding that our kids need. Um, so that's my, but I would look to Every Child and see to their website um, and to their opportunities to join kind of advocacy, uh, join to advocate along with them if you're really interested in K through 12 and kind of the Leandro case in particular. I'm gonna answer one more and then maybe there are some that are a little more nitty gritty about the fiscal map that Matt or Amelia you could um, do. Uh, there was also a question just sort of like, <laughs> there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of terminology in this map. There's like in terms of, uh, understanding all of the key phrases and the sort the acronyms and sources of funding, um, and sort of whether there's materials that we can share with grassroots folks to make that easier to uh, digest and easier to share. We have tried whenever possible in the fiscal map to like offer definitions of things. I recognize it's really just dense information. And so if there are, if folks are trying to use it and have specific questions, you're very welcome to reach out, you know, directly to me. And sometimes I might like punt and pass it to, to Nat or Amelia to help answer questions. Um, but we're also happy to uh, hear about if there are specific resources that folks are interested in kind of to provide some of those definitions, for example. We at BTC in our own publications uh, really want to be responsive to what advocates need. So um, again, if there's a sort of specific uh, like explanation that you're interested in related to the fiscal map, please reach out to us. And then uh, also on our website, there's a lot of different kinds of publications and advocacy materials related more broadly to these issues around taxes and around funding priorities. Um, Logan, I can answer some questions um, that uh, Tom posed. So to make state comparisons, is there somewhere we can find per capita numbers for the budget components? Um, I, I hope I'll answer this correctly, but uh, we only did a per capita for the, the state investment in children, youth ages 0 to 24, and not um, breaking that down by parts of the budget components that you know, for specific services for that age group. Um, but if you want to make state-by-state -state comparisons, you can either uh, look at the national analysis and uh, a little Power BI hack. If you, um, I showed you how to click on North Carolina and you can see their dot of the trend line show up. If you hold the shift button, then you can select multiple states um, and, and see their state budget comparisons, or you can just pull up each, um, state fiscal map and that state budget comparisons tab and look um, across the state. So that's how I recommend um, doing a comparison of the states. I hope that answers your question. Um, and then to add more states to our partnership now that the infrastructure has been developed. So our goal at Children's Funding Project is to have the whole country mapped, have all 50 states um, with this fiscal um, 
map infrastructure. And so um, it's just gonna take some time as, as we build out that capacity internally and then also um, build readiness and capacity with all 50 states. And so um, I think that our practices are being refined over time and we're just adding um, individual states as as they're ready and as as we're able to add more to, to our partnerships list. So again, hoping to reach all 50 states and then to keep those all living. I just don't know exactly how long uh, that will take. Uh, I think for some of the questions around um, uh, specific uh, program funding and like local uh, different school district funding, um, that won't be uh, visible in the state fiscal map. Um, I did answer this already, but what we try to map is the source of funds and not a, and that's different than doing like a program inventory that is a, then a list of all the programs that are available in the state. But if you are a provider or if you um, live in a locality and you're interested in learning about what funds are available for your type of service, then that's how you can utilize that eligible services page and say if you were a out of school time provider or if you um, uh, were a direct service provider for um, foster involved youth, you can click on the specific services that, that you may be providing and see what funding streams are available. One, to see if you are accessing all potential funds um, uh, and if there's some way that you can better utilize them or, or receive those dollars. If you're not, if you're not receiving them already. It's also um, something that you can reach out directly to us at BTC about if there is a, a particular program within North Carolina um, that you are interested in kind of understanding how it's being funded. Um, you know, uh, part of what we do is try to provide, uh, you know, analysis directly to folks that are going to use it for their, their advocacy. And, uh, you know, depending on we can't always do everything that folks ask us for because sometimes it's uh, uh, the data isn't there. But if you're uh, interested in something that isn't in the fiscal map, but is sort of about general state funding, you're welcome to reach out directly to me and we can we can see what we can get you. Um, and I think we've answered questions that I, taking a look, um, I think we've done our best to get to everything to, um, oh, there was sorry, one more question about K through 12 education funding and sort of how that relates to school districts um, and whether it includes uh, like rural or small county supplements. So yes, the state education, K through 12 education funding would include any like supplemental district funding that's coming from the state. What this doesn't show you is how that breaks out by school district. So really, you know, this is at the total state level. We have, uh, there's almost 100 school districts because there's, uh, I actually don't know how many there are, but there's more or less one school district per county in North Carolina. And so this isn't showing, you know, it broken down by district. And it's also not including, this is something that, um, you know, Amelia and Nat have mentioned, but I think it's especially important to like hammer home when talking about K through 12 is that it doesn't include local funding. So there are also, you know, significant local funds that, that go into K through 12 education. Um, so again, this is really more about seeing that overall picture rather than like the district level, but I'm, Okay, I see um, Yvonne in the chat saying there are 115 school districts. So we have someone who is more of an expert than I am, <laughs> for sure, on um, that question. Uh, but again, there, Every Child NC has done some really good analysis around like district level funding and kind of what districts would see if the Leandro plan were fully funded. So I would definitely look to them as a resource. And I would also um, 
again, you're you're welcome to reach out to us if you have kind of data questions that haven't been asked yet. And I think with that, that I'm going to draw us to a close. Uh, um, so I will, my email uh, was on the first slide, but I'm just going to bring it up again here. Here's my contact information, um, as well as kind of our general contact information at the Budget and Tax Center. I, um, as uh, Katerina has been saying in the chat, but we are going to sh send around the recording, a copy of the slides, and just, you know, a kind of summary with key links that we've been sharing. Um, and what we would also love from you is as you're using the fiscal map to kind of be in touch with us again about uh, how you're using it, if you have ideas for improving it, um, you know, as we keep working with Children's Funding Project on kind of the future years, we want to make it like as useful as possible. Um, any last words, Nat or Amelia from you? Okay, well, thank you so much to everybody for joining us. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. We hope to see you at a Budget and Tax Center event before too long.